Okay, the first thing that, that pops to my mind uh, that, that I wanted to ask you is, you know, I've noticed over the years that uh, people with schizophrenia broke down into three different classes, and we've talked about that before. There was the segment, and, and that breaks up into about thirds. The segment who bre uh, believes what psychiatry tells them, that the voices are uh, hallucinations, they're not real, mm -hmm. um, that there's nothing they can do about them other than take uh, these powerful psychotropic drugs uh, for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> and uh, that they're not real. Mm -hmm. uh, the second group is a group that's confused. They're not quite sure whether they're real or not. They don't know what they are. They are not sure how they react, but they know that they're bad. Um, the people they've talked to, if, for the most part, psychiatrists and, and counselors are telling them that these things are hallucinations, but that's not their experience. Their experience is that they are very real, but they don't know that for sure. You know, they suspect it, uh, and and they're kind of confused about what's going on. You know, they don't fully buy psychiatry's explanation that the voices are hallucinations, but they're not quite sure that they're not themselves either, because we've been taught all our lives that whatever you hear in your head is you. I mean, that's you talking. So it's very confusing for them. The third group are the group that know that these things are entities. Um, they don't quite know what to do about them, but they know that they are not who they are. I so it was the one that bought hook, line, and sinker, the, the, uh, the tale that the psychiatrists give them. Yeah, those are the ones that are the most far gone. They, the, the systems that we found that will help these people and, and, and a lot of times will lead to a cure will not work with those people. As long as they believe the voices are hallucinations, there's nothing that can really be done for them except take the toxic meds that psychiatry dishes out. So my question to you was, <clears throat> would be the group from your experience, the middle group, you know, the group that needs to be turned around to believing the truth that these things are entities that are affecting them and are not uh, hallucinations. How do we go about convincing those people or how did you find through your progress uh, when you were dealing with these things that uh, what you were hearing was not you? Well, I, I knew right off the bat. I just knew that they were not me, so, so I sensed it. And a lot of people do that. And uh, there's no formula for, here's what I did to figure out that these were not me. I knew they were not me. They were they were inconsistent with with what I was thinking, and they were inconsistent with how I was feeling. So I knew how I was feeling, and I knew how I was thinking. And then these thoughts came in that were contrary to that. So those, those are the, that's the first group. And they're the most uh, open to the idea that these are entities. These are living beings with a consciousness. And the second group that doesn't really know what they are, but they know they're not who, they're not them. Uh, I would think that those would be a lot easier to point to, you know, here, take a look at this. You know, you don't have to agree with it right off the bat, but consider that you know that these are not your these are not your voices, right? You know they're not coming from you. So where are they coming from? It doesn't matter where they're coming from as long as you know they're not coming from you. So if they don't want to believe that they're demons or uh, living beings, I don't think that really matters that much. I think it, what's important is that they know that they're not coming from them and they're not the, they're not their thoughts. So then they can uh, look at the thoughts that are coming in and know that what those thoughts are telling them are flat out lies. The problem that I see <clears throat> is that so many people have been brainwashed into believing that they're not enough, that they'll never be good enough, they'll never be smart enough, they're too fat, they're too skinny, they're too tall, they're too short, they're, they're not smart. They, they get that drummed into them as children so then the voices just play on that. So there's a double whammy here where a person has to believe in themselves 
But how do they do that when all they've ever heard was lies about themselves? And that that's just played up by the voices. So, so the thing is that if you can get somebody to actually see that they've been lied to about who they are, what they are, how they are, that'll get them thinking about it. But that's a hard road to go on. I mean, it's it's a tough thing to to realize, well, okay, maybe I really am a good person. <laughs> That's hard to believe, you know? So, I mean, they just have to work on it. They have to work on it every single day. It doesn't come naturally. Not when they become brainwashed like that. And how do you suggest they would do that? Well, I don't know for sure. There's no one good answer. I mean, there's a lot of different avenues they can, they can, um, oh boy, they can talk to other people. Uh, they can, uh, they, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that they go to a psychiatrist because a psychiatrist isn't going to, uh, you know, tell them, well, you really are a good person no matter what you think. And just because maybe you did some bad things doesn't make you a bad person. You know, they're not going to say that, I don't think. Are they? No, no. They're 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 going to leave that office with some kind of drug. Yeah. Uh, so. Maybe after 15, 20 minutes, they'll they'll be given some kind of drug. And with schizophrenics, it would result in a chemical lobotomy. Um, wouldn't well, wouldn't yeah. solve anything. Now that what I found surprised me when the the one time that I've heard these things and after praying to hear them was that their voice in my head sounded just like my the all the other thoughts you know the tens of thousands of other thoughts that go through my mind in a day there was no change in the timber or the the volume or or it, it sounded just like another one of my thoughts only you know, I knew it wasn't. Yeah, so that's the that's the big trick. So if if a person is already brainwashed into thinking they're no good or they're flawed in some way, and then here comes a voice that sounds just like your own thought that drums that in, you know, I mean, if a person really wants to get over this, they're going to have to stop and think, is that true? Well, if they're brainwashed into thinking it's true, their first idea is going to be, yeah, it's true. I, I really am a, you know, I'm flawed in this way. So then, you know, they have to, I think the first thing that comes to my mind is tapping, where you tap and you you do the karate chop, you know, the tapping routine, where you do the karate chop on your, on your hand and, um, and then you're saying something like, even though I feel like I'm stupid, I totally love and respect myself. Even though I think I'm flawed and I'm a bad person, I totally love and respect myself. You say that over and over again, and then you do the tapping points, saying those things. That will actually trigger your subconscious and your meridians and eventually they'll they'll make you stop and think, well, okay, so is that really true? Am I really this bad person that, you know, I've been called a bad person. I've been called a stupid person. I've been, you know, I've been called a knucklehead. I've been called, you know, just all kinds of different names by other people. Is that really true? And if they can get it through their heads that it's not true, you know, that's just the brainwashing coming out of the people that are calling them the names and they don't know any different either. That's their upbringing, but it's not your upbringing. What you're getting is um, programming from others. You're not programming yourself. So that's the challenge is to program yourself. And to overcome the, I mean, of, of the, the reasons that the psychiatric mafia gives for schizophrenia, you know, they started blaming mothers, then they went to genetics. They went to these these advanced reasons that the average man and the average practitioner cannot either debunk or prove. So they went to the genetic theory saying there's some kind of genetic thing wrong. Then they went to the uh, chemical imbalance theory and then there's something wrong with their brains. The The only one that has any substance from what I can see is the environmental theory where 
what I've seen over and over again in, in my practice in the years I've worked on the front lines and uh, and mental health was that virtually every schizophrenic I spoke to either had a massive amount of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse by their parents or somebody else, which was negative programming, or they were using drugs, you know, especially amphetamine. So here you have years and years of programming by a bad family or a negative situation or years of sexual abuse that they can't talk to them. They're all, they have all this built up inside and and they're told they're bad they're told they're rotten uh they're told they they have no worth and and you know this is emotionally drummed into them and then all of a sudden you go well how am i going to even begin to question this you know and then the voices jump in there and they just they just feed the fire yeah see the 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 abuse opens up the door for the voices yeah. to come in it, Yes, and the person already has been told numerous times that they're no good. Then the voices come in and they just jam it down their throat and, you know, blow it up even further than the, the humans did. And so here's the person being bombarded from the from all sides outside. Coming from the outside, from the from the environmental side and from the voices side, they're just being bombarded over and over again. So it takes a lot of inner strength, which they don't have at the moment. They have to, first of all, they have to want to live a different life. So that's a challenge because if they're used to, to uh, you know, living this downtrodden life, they don't know anything else. That's all they know. So they're going to have to uh think about it and then the voices will come in and say oh that's really stupid you'll never am amount to anything and blah de, blah de, blah they'll turn they'll 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 punch that down every moment so uh, what i did i mean i was in the midst of all of that i went through all of that i had the brainwashing of the normal environment of a dysfunctional family and then added on to that i had all that horrific abuse and, uh, you know, I got it from all sides. I got it from my parents. I got it from the Catholic orphanage. You know, I got it from the uh, from the um, the juvenile detention center. You know, I just got it every everywhere I turned. I was a bad person. So I believed that I was a bad person. So I, you know, but I somehow knew inside that I really wasn't a bad person. And I don't know how that happened. You know, might have been might have been the creator that was planting that in me that, that, you know, there is a little spark in each one of us. There's a tiny little spark of spirit in each and every one of us. And it gets buried with what, you know, slush and sludge and mud and crap and, you know, just all kinds of garbage. And here's this little bitty light trying to shine through. And it will shine through if you let it. So. I, I guess I got to this point of somehow realizing that there was a little spark in me that was all covered up, you know, and uh, but it was there. I somehow knew that, and I wanted that to shine through. I didn't have the foggiest idea how to go about doing it, but I had the desire. And when you have the desire universe is on your side i can vouch for that when you have the desire universe is on your side and things will happen in your life to help you um you know fulfill that desire it has to be a deep desire and even though you don't have the foggiest idea where to start when you have that desire universe will do something or cause something to happen so that you know you'll you'll start to go forward and from there, you just go forward and you go forward and you go forward and you're battling the whole time. You're shoving this stuff away and it keeps coming back and it keeps coming back even stronger because you're fighting it, right? That's what I went through. And before I came up with the That's a Lie program, uh, you know, it was about, well, I didn't come up with the That's a Lie program until I was 50 years old. So I went through all those years of battling. 
and trying and getting into, um, you know, reading spiritual books and reading quantum physics and reading the scriptures. And, you know, uh, I, I knew I didn't want to go to church because I always I was already turned away from from church because I knew that they were abusive because of my own experience. So let me but, let me clarify. Let me clarify a second. So number one, you're saying you have to have the intent. It needs to be your intention to work past this yeah. and to get out of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and number two, you actually started moving toward a positive spiritual path and seeking the opposite of what you were being told. Yeah, I kept getting knocked down, but I kept on going anyway. You know, it's like one of those, um, I don't know what movie I'm thinking of, but there's, I want to say Gladiator movie or something where the the guy gets knocked down and he keeps getting up and he gets knocked down and he keeps getting up and, he, you know, he continuously gets knocked down and he's just about beaten to death and he keeps getting up. But that doesn't was, give up. That was me. And you know from knowing me that I don't give up. <laughs> yeah, I do that. I know that. <laughs> you know, and I don't either. I mean, that one of the things I think I, you know, we respect in each other. I mean, despite the beatings we've taken, we just get up and keep going. Yeah. But see, what are, what about the 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 voices are very sly about how they uh, they they change reality. You know, and I've seen a lot of cases where they will take stimulus coming originating in the environment and have the the person interpret it wrong you know for instance oh those people are laughing at me or those people are staring at me or those people are talking behind my back or you know these are like basically innocuous cues you know that most people would ignore that the voices get people to take and turn against themselves Oh, for sure they do. They do. Yeah. How they, how would you suggest people deal with that? Well, yeah, they have to get to the point of realizing that what other people think about them is none of your business. I mean, it's none of my business what other people think of me, right? That's their business. It's not mine. And whatever they're thinking of me, whether it's right or wrong, is not my business. So if a person can get that through, that's a simple way to think about it. It's a it's a more complicated thing than that for sure. But if they can, if a person can just you know think of that, okay, so whatever they're thinking of me, it's not my business. <laughs> so let me think about what I think of me. What do I think of me? Well, I think I'm scum. Well, that's a lie. You know. So I mean, you you have to have this inner dialogue going on. And in and when you're first starting, like when I first started, it was a constant inner dialogue. And um, you know, I mean, of course, I was I was by myself a lot too, so that was an advantage. If I had been around a family constantly, I don't know if I would have been able to be as successful as I was. And that goes contrary to what you're talking about, where they do like to isolate a person. In my case, I was isolated uh, a lot in my life, and uh, so I, I, you know, I had this uh, inner dialogue going on that was, you know, people would, some of my friends would always talk about me as to being the silent one, the quiet one. You know, they'd, I'd be out in the backyard when everybody else was partying inside the house. I'd be out in the backyard, and I'd be thinking, but not, not. Uh, I'd be more spacing out than thinking, you know. And uh, so people would say, well, what are you thinking about? And I'd say, oh, I don't know, just nothing really. I mean, and I really wasn't. I was just kind of getting in touch with with myself and having this mild inner dialogue, sometimes mild, sometimes very warrior-like. But I had this inner dialogue going on of, you know, I'd, I don't know, I'd hear something negative about myself. Or, and then it'd be the thing of, well, this person's talking behind your back. And I'd say, you know what? I don't really care what they're saying because it's really none of my business what they're saying. So that that helped me a lot. I don't know if it would help other people, but it helped me a lot. Yeah, or who cares what they're saying? But uh, 
I, I remember, you know, when you first told me about the That's a Lie program, I knew it was true right away because I, I'd worked with so many patients that their, their, their voices were telling them lies. Mm -hmm. you know? And, and I, I was wondering, well, if you know their lies, then why do you listen to them? And I kept asking them that over and over again. And the response I got was, because they sound so friggin' real. They do they sound. Are so, they are so friggin' convincing. Mm -hmm. So w what do you do about that? Because that, that's going to affect them all. They, it, it's like they, they get sucked into you know, what they're being told. And it agrees with you know, the abuse that they've had in the past. Mm -hmm. So it, it's like a chain that, that you know, why do you, li why do you keep listening to them? And they go, because they're so damn convincing. What, what would you suggest to those people? And I'll tell you, that's a majority of them. Yeah, I, know, I understand because I went through that. And so what I found is when it becomes a loop where the same idea, the same thoughts come back over and over and over again ad nauseum, then you know that that's really not coming from you. I mean, you're off doing your own thing and all of a sudden here comes this loop that throws you for a loop, really. I mean, it, it, it catches you off guard. You're in the middle of a conversation with somebody and all of a sudden you get this idea that, you know, they're laughing at you. They're just trying to be polite. They're not really meaning what they're saying. And so, uh, and that'll, that'll, go, that'll go in a, in a loop over and over and over again while you're trying to talk. <laughs> so you're trying to talk over these thoughts. And then what I would do, I would usually try to excuse myself from the conversation or from the room. And then I'd just sit down and go th and think, you know, I'd let it, I'd let it flow and I'd be watching this going on. And I'm like, I don't know how to get rid of this, but I know it's not me. So, so I, I had this I had this major desire to get out of that loop and I you know I had no idea how to do that. So you didn't try to resist it or stop it. You let it flow and watched it. Yeah. Okay, so the, like you were observing it as a third party. Right. So that kind of removed you from the situation and allowed you to kind of analyze what was going on to some degree. Well, I didn't analyze it. I just watched it. You know, like I was watching a movie. And, and so, uh, and I don't know if everybody can do that. I would imagine that, that everybody could do that, but maybe not. I don't know. But if they have to know that this is not coming from them. And w when it gets to the point of being a loop, uh, a repeating loop over and over and over and over and over again, same thing over and over and over again, day after day, week after week, month after month, it's the same thing. And you're like, I can't get rid of this thought. Right. It just I can't get it's like having a song play in your head all day long and you just can't stop thinking about it. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same kind of thing. It's over and over and over again. And when that loop happens, whether it takes a day to realize it or a month or, you know, a week or whatever, once you realize that it's a loop, that's when you can start sit back and watch it. And not take it in as real, just watch it. And then you can say, you know, I, you know, I have no idea what this is, but I know it's not me. So then when you do that, you're not giving out any negative emotional uh, frequencies. So you're not giving them any food. Well, that, that's another question. How long and what, what, what was the process that you took before you realized that these things were parasites, that they were energetic parasites? You know, what I've seen is that even though I would point that out to patients over and over again and say, well, after the voices leave, what's your energy level like? And they would say, well, it's down in the dumps. And I said, well, how many thousands of times has that happened to you? And they'd say, thousands of times. And I'm like, well, where does your energy go? And they would consistently say, I don't know. Yeah, well, they don't know where their energy goes. They know they just know that their energy is gone. And so, I mean, when you when you stop and think about it, it's like, OK, my energy is gone. I have no energy at all. I have no idea where it went. I mean, that's knowing that your energy is gone 
doesn't automatically equate to that the voices ate your energy. No, no, it doesn't. But there's a one-to-one correlation between that. And, and I've seen the voices actually block their realization of that. You know, even if you point it out in many different ways, they just can't see it. Yeah, I, I know that. That's so how did, how did you break through that? Um, let me think. Uh, I don't think I broke through it right away. Uh, and I don't really remember when I came to the realization that these were entities. I think I... I think I got that when it was a combination of of studying this, the biblical scriptures, and that led me to to quantum physics. And then I knew when I realized in quantum physics that uh, everything is energy. Up until then, I knew we were all just atoms, and that was a breakthrough in thought. Uh, of you know we're we're just all floating atoms. <laughs> so I was imagining it. But when I got into quantum physics, which which came from reading the scriptures, because what I saw in the scriptures was um, the words of the the red printed words of Jesus. They were the most profound words to me. They were um, they were. You know that I I don't know how that led me to going to quantum physics, but I. I somehow knew that there was a science behind what he was saying. And that because he was saying things like, I don't remember the exact words, but he was saying things like, uh, think about the things that are not as though they were, and then they will be. Well, that's quantum physics right there. You know, that's our that's our energy going out into the universe. And if we're in in frequency with what we want, then it manifests itself. So like you get what you expect. Uh, I don't know if it's what you expect, but you get what you are. What your frequency is, is what what uh, your reality becomes. If that makes any sense. Well, it makes sense. But the, the question would be like, then how do you increase your frequency? With with these things constantly um, well, at you, your throat. Yeah, imagination is a very powerful tool, and the voices use imagination to um, mess against, with perception yeah, against you. Yeah, yeah. So, so it's but it's a very powerful tool on either side, the negative or the positive. So you can imagine the worst, and if you keep imagining the worst, guess what? The worst comes. If you imagine the best, and you're in that frequency all the time, then the best comes. So how how would you suggest a, a a paranoid schizophrenic who is paranoid and and you know halfway convinced that you know the, the perceptions of the voices are his own uh, would turn around and and begin on a positive path to increase their frequency mm-hmm. uh, or, or even to re- realize that these things are draining their energy. Well, I that, 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 that's the last thing they want these people to realize is that they are energetic parasites. They get very upset when that topic is brought up. Yeah. So, I mean, when you're dealing with a paranoid schizophrenic and you've dealt with them, I've never dealt with a paranoid schizophrenic. Um, well, I, I guess I did deal with one one time on a project that I was on. Um, and I, I took a cigarette break. And uh, so he came out. And he sat down on the bench with me, and uh, he was he was very upset. And I said, "So what's happening?" And he said, "I don't I don't know if I can tell you this." And I said, "Well, you can tell me anything you want to tell me. I you know I'm I'm not going to judge." <clears throat> and um, so he said, "Well, I think I'm the Antichrist." I said, "You think you're the Antichrist?" And I already knew how the voices worked. So I thought, oh, this poor guy, he's being convinced by something that he's the Antichrist. If he was serious mm-hmm. and he was scared to death and he didn't want to be the Antichrist. He was frightened to death. I could see it in his eyes. And I said, oh, hey, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. You are not the Antichrist. And he's like, how do you know that? I said, well, uh, none of us are the Antichrist uh, because, you know, I mean, you're a human being and the Antichrist is not a human being. And he's like, well, what if I came in human form? And I said, so 
have you, I, I forget how I talked to him, but uh, anyway, I ended up with letting him know that he was a spiritual being and he came from the creator that created all things and that creator creates with love and not hate and the antichrist is hate. So I said, you know, do you hate me? He's like, no, I don't hate you. Well, I said, do you hate this person? No, I don't hate this person. Well, so the Antichrist hates everybody. So you can't be the Antichrist or something like that. Anyway, the end of the conversation was he realized that um, the thoughts going on in his head were not his own. And this was way before I developed the That's a Lie program, years before I developed it. So... Um, Anyway, that was the story of that particular encounter, and but he was very paranoid, and I just, I don't know, I just said that, you know, he's a spiritual being, and he was made by the, the creator, and the creator makes things with love and not hate, and that was enough for him. I don't know if it would work on anybody else. Well, I'd say it was a good start. <clears throat> now, what, what's ringing in my head is uh, spiritual being. And, you know, in four years of undergraduate school and four years of graduate school, not once was spirit mentioned in any of the psychology classes. It, yeah. It's like it, it didn't exist. It was like being in the middle of the Sahara Desert. Well, and we know that this is a spiritual malady. Schizophrenia is a spiritual disorder. It's got nothing to do with physical anything. Um, Yet, yet the the system keeps teaching that we're physical beings. I mean, psychology, psychiatry, uh, big pharma, um, you know, the entire establishment is we're physical beings, and this is a spiritual disorder of a spiritual being. What do you suggest? Well, the first thing is we're living in a material world, right? Yes. And so we went from being spiritually inclined, which was uh, then back in the day when the church ruled, which wasn't all that good, but at least we had spirit in mind. And so, but that changed when, um, when science was uh, developed, and that was, what, a couple hundred years ago. And so the church uh, didn't want to get out of it. The church didn't want to turn over all of its power. So they split it. They split church and science into two separate things. So the, the material world, which was the, the scientific world, um, they went for all material, and then the, the church went for all spiritual and no science. So that's the first mistake. <clears throat> and we're just now getting to the point of realizing that the two have to work together because Things like consciousness have to be included in the equations. And there are there are a lot of scientists today who are realizing that. And they're, you know, like, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there are a handful of scientists that are putting consciousness into their equations so that they don't have to make up things like dark matter, you know, to fill in the blanks. They, they just, that's what science does. They have this this thing that they can't quite get the answer to, and so they have to fill in the blank to make the, their equation work. Well, that doesn't mean their equation is right, right? <laughs> so so that's what doctors, what, that's what people are trained with in the universities. They're trained in the material world. If they want to get into the spiritual world, they have to go to a school that teaches spirituality. So the two aren't mixing right now. That's why you're running into that problem. Yeah, and it, it doesn't look like they are they have any intention for them to mix either. You you look at what psychiatry has been doing. They don't have a cause for paranoid schizophrenia in their cosmology. Uh, so they keep making them up. At first they blame mothers, then they blame genetics. Uh, they did all these twin studies and they found out that there was no no causative link. There was no schizophrenic uh, gene. There was no schizophrenic germ. Um, you know, then they went to the chemical imbalance theory, and they found out that you know 
<clears throat> there was no chemical imbalance that they could prove. And matter of fact, they didn't even know what the balance of the chemicals in the brain should be. Then they went to the the uh, uh, physiological structure of the brain, saying, oh yeah, there's something wrong with their brains. There's something physiologically wrong with their brains, but they couldn't find that either. So uh, what, they, what they happened was they started doing autopsies on schizophrenics who died and found that their brains had shrunk. So the psychiatric mafia jumped on that along with Big Pharma and go, yeah, yeah, look, it's a schizophrenia that's doing this. Uh, then they found out that virtually every single one of those people had been on these strong, toxic, neuroleptic drugs for, for years. Uh, and, and there was a one-to-one -one correspondence between the damage done to their neurological system and their brains and the amount of time they'd been on these drugs. But psychiatry and big pharma jumps up and go, no, no, it's, it's the schizophrenic process that did it. So they started uh, testing mice and monkeys, and, and half of them they put on these antipsychotic drugs, the other half they didn't. And they found out that these drugs were the cause of the damage to the neurological system. Uh, and that, that uh, they, got, they faced some massive lawsuits for that. But they, you know, what I've seen is when they dish out these drugs, they don't tell patients about the, the toxic side effects. They basically say, well, you're going to feel groggy for a few days and that'll clear up after a while. You know, they don't tell them about the tardive dyskinesia or the akinesia or the, or the, the, the different neurological deficits that are going to uh, occur on a large scale with large long-term uh, use of these drugs. Uh, yeah, they, they, have, they have no cause. They, they, they don't know what causes this, and they keep pushing one false cause after another. i got to ask you a question. In these, in these uh, psychotropic drugs, is there a fold-out in the, in the drug package that tells the, the person all about the drug and what the side effects are? Yeah, uh, there is, but they don't know what a lot of those terms mean, you know, like akinesia or tardive dyskinesia or... Uh, malignant serotonin syndrome they, they they don't know what all that stuff means um you know and there are a list of common side effects that they will understand that the psychiatrists very seldom ever tell them about and i've seen this over and over again they just you know they, they turn them loose without these things so a lot of times they prescribe these drugs in hospitals or emergency rooms and they don't tell the patient what the side effects are um and when they do go get their prescription, they do get these things. But a lot of these people suffering from these psychiatric disorders don't have the wherewithal to sit down and, and study these things. And half of it is written in psychiatric lingo that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're not warned about it. Yeah, I know that. And so I guess my question is, um, if if the person who is suffering has any uh, any loved ones around them, then... And, and I would advise families to get a hold of that uh, that printout and read it through. And then if there's a term they don't understand, we have the Internet now. They can go look it up. That's that shouldn't be you know, that should be the psychiatrist's job, but they're not doing their job. So, uh, I mean, somebody that takes their their uh, loved one to a psychiatrist and needs their head examined in the first place, but they don't know any difference. They've been taught that when you have a mental disorder, they you you go to the mental doctor. When you and have you a heart trust them, doctor, you go to the heart doctor. When you have a foot disorder, you go to the foot doctor. So, you know, I mean, and you just turn over all your power to them and trust everything they're saying because they know they know all. Well, that's a big, big mistake in the first place, but that's part of the programming that everybody goes through. So we're breaking out of that now, uh, especially in the current times, which I won't mention because I don't want us to get kicked off. But uh, so the thing that's going on now is a, is a perfect example of, OK, here's this thing that they're giving us and here's this printout that's blank. <laughs> And, you know, so how do we know what's in it? So let's just take it anyway and see what happens. I mean, kind of, you know, that's kind of the way that uh, humanity has been programmed these days. It's they, they just they just march to the end of the cliff and jump off. But there are right. those who don't do that. And there are uh, 
there are those who will be curious enough to find out what's going on. And unfortunately, that's a very small percent of people. Well, I think that's that's critically good advice that you gave is to, to look up the side effects uh, because the, the psychiatrists aren't going to tell you. And they're not going to especially not going to tell you about the most dangerous ones. So those are going to be the ones in the in the the drug literature are all these big words that you don't understand. And what they are is is words to describe neurological damage that is occurring because of these drugs. And most people will hit these like tardive dyskinesia or akinesia or, or uh, serotonin malignant syndrome. They're going to look at these and then they're going to blow those off. They're not going to look up what that actually means. And those are the most dangerous symptoms. And those are the ones that psychiatry, I've never seen a psychiatrist ever in, in you know, 40 years ever sit down and tell a patient about these things before they happened. And unfortunately, what I've seen in the state hospital and public institutions like the prisons is when these side effects, these dangerous neurological side effects start occurring, instead of withdrawing the person off of these drugs and, and trying something else, what they do is they'll throw cogentin or some other kind of drug on top of it to mask these serious symptoms of neurological damage so they're not experienced by the patient. And that continue that allows the, the the destructive neurological process to continue as these drugs rot out their brains and central nervous system without them feeling it. So, it, yeah, your suggestion is is very important. Is is look up the side effects. Many of them they'll be able to recognize. You know, uh, but the ones that are the most dangerous are the ones that they're not going to recognize. Yeah, and so the medical. Um industry does the same thing to, to other kinds of ailments. If they, give a, um, if they give a drug to, say, take care of high blood pressure, <clears throat> and then they, if there's some sort of reaction, then they'll give another drug to mask that reaction. Meanwhile, the body is falling apart while it's trying to fix itself, and the, and the individual is pouring stuff into them that is co going contrary to what the body's trying to do. We're learning this now, and more and more people are becoming aware of this now, and the pharmaceuticals are having a hissy fit over it. Well, they've, they've blocked a lot of the research. Um, you know, they've taken control of Congress and the Senate. Two-thirds of the Congress and two-thirds of the Senate have taken big money from the drug companies, and they've, they've uh, forged laws that are not in the best interest of the people. You know, they're more in the best interest of the, the drug companies. They're uh, not in the best interest of the people because the dark side is trying to kill us. Plain and simple, the dark side is out to kill us, and they have invaded these people who are, you know, um, for whatever reason, they are open to uh, thinking about money more than, uh, more than uh, the health of the person. They, uh, you know, they're they're in the material world 100%. So people need to realize that we're in a spiritual war, in a big spiritual war, and uh, you know, I don't know how many people are going to survive this. Yeah, I hear you. They're pouring those vaccines into people at a at a horrendous rate and just pushing it when there are therapeutics that are available cheaply that will deal with this this vax this uh, uh, this thing that they're doing virus. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, not, it, it's not even a. It's not well. They're calling it a virus, but it's a pathogen that they developed, uh, and they're calling it a virus because you know. Virus means poison, and the pathogen is a poison. Well, so are these psychiatric drugs that they're feeding schizophrenics. Um, now, th that's not to say that they're not useful. I mean, in order to use the kind of materials and programs that we've come up with, the patient needs to be somewhat coherent. They need to be able to listen. They need, able to, need to be able to understand and follow through on instructions. If they're so far gone they can't do those things, the only way to bring them back is to use these drugs temporarily until they can get these uh, these systems operational and start attacking the voices on their own. Um, 
then there's those that they're not going to be reached no matter what you do. I've seen far too many of them. They're just so far gone. The only thing they can take is drugs. And the drugs are basically to keep them under control. Yeah. They cure nothing. Yeah. And, you know, I, I agree with you on the um, the exorcism thing of if a person is uh, goes to an exorcist and, and the exorcist is successful in getting d- the demon out of them, if they don't start walking a spiritual path, and I'm not talking about religion, I'm talking about do what's right, do what's good, uh, you know, uh, think about others and think about yourself and do the right thing all the time and, and uh, you know, be aware that you are a spiritual being. If they don't do that, the, the, the demons are just going to come back and they'll come back tenfold. Yeah, they will. I've seen that over and over again. You know, if they don't get on and stay on a positive spiritual path, these things will come back, especially if they're bored. I mean, they will just be back flastered in grease lightning and they'll bring their friends with them. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that's a pretty, pretty good um, coverage of the topic of the, the drugs and, um, you know, the, the problems that schizophrenics face. They, um, they don't, you know, not everybody knows about you, Jerry, and your work. And uh, thank goodness there are other other doctors that are finding you and uh, willing to work with you. So I think that's really great. Well, how are, how are you doing on some of these proposals that some of these uh, doctors are sending to you? Well, uh, what I've got is a number of them where I go, oh, I've seen this. I agree with it. Uh, and then I'll write them back and say, are you willing to speak out about it? And And they go, no. Oh. And I can, I can understand that because I really couldn't speak out about this stuff while I was working because they would they would have got me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't know how many times. Well, twice, twice I've been called up in front of psychiatrists for questioning schizophrenic patients about what their voices were saying to them. And I, I was told, you don't do that. You're reinforcing their hallucinations and you're making them worse. And I didn't see that at all. I didn't see that I was making them worse. I didn't see that I was reinforcing anything. They were just in the same shape after I asked them these questions as before, except their voices didn't like them talking to me. You know, it's Um, weird. I mean, if I would think that any any medical professional would want to know what the patient is experiencing whether it's a physical matter or, or an emotional matter or whatever, they want to know from their perspective what they're experiencing. What are they hearing? I mean, I would, I would want to know that. I mean, you did. Well, yeah, would, I, any, any medical professional worth their salt would want to find out what the patient is actually experiencing. Agreed. And that's one of the things that mystified me when I got to uh, Central State Hospital. They, you know, they already felt that they knew what the voices were. They'd been taught in medical school, they'd been taught in nursing schools that the voices were hallucinations and that you don't question that. Anybody who did got beat down. Well, you, you know? thought that too from your your education, right? I got that too. And when I got to the state hospital, I, I believed that like everybody else did. And I questioned psych nurses, I questioned psychiatrists, I questioned doctors, I questioned psychologists. What are the voices? What are the voices? Oh, they're hallucinations. They all believe that. But, you know, then I I saw the patients walking around talking to themselves and arguing with themselves. And, you know, I I remember one day I snuck up behind one and and he's carrying on a, a conversation with something, somebody. And and it was like a, a phone call where you only hear half the conversation. So I'm like, well, what are the voices telling them? None of them, none of them had any curiosity about what these voices were telling the patients. They were merely unreal hallucinations that that didn't make any sense, that were just a, a form of insanity to be ignored. You know, there was no curiosity about what they were saying. And when I did try to find out what they were saying, I got called up in front of psychiatry and warned to stop. 
Yeah, yeah. So your, your tag of the, calling him the mafia is so appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what they act like, you know. The, it's it's and look at look at what I had to go through just to get access to a population of of mentally ill people and and have the freedom to work with them and question them on my own. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it it was at least six years. I mean, four years of psych, two years of graduate school before I was even allowed access. And and over the the forty forty five years I spent working in all these different psychiatric institutions, I never, ever saw a single researcher enter any of those institutions or be given permission to do so by the establishment. Yes, there was always right. some, some reason they couldn't, it's too dangerous. Well, we can't, we can't account for your safety. Um, you know, we don't know what you're doing. Uh, we can't provide security for you. Uh, yeah, they, they wouldn't let them in. Nobody with a curious mind was allowed in there, and they made sure you were plenty brainwashed before before I got in there. And like all the rest, I believed the voices were hallucinations when I first got there, too, until things started not making sense. But I was asking questions about them, and nobody else was. Yeah. And we found they run patterns. They they run the same repetitive patterns over and over again. But if you believe they're hallucinations and that they're not real, you're not going to be looking for anything like that. Anything that runs fixed patterns is not a hallucination. See, see, Jerry, let me interrupt for a second. Um, the fact that they run patterns, this is the, the, the loop that I'm talking about. They run the same loop over and over and over again, and it's it's um, it's uh, geared toward the individual because they have access to your memory. So if they are running a particular pattern and a loop over and over again, that's a clue to the person experiencing it that those are not their thoughts. So when the person just realizes, okay, these are not my thoughts, so I don't know how to get rid of them, but they're not my thoughts, they're not me, so let me just watch these thoughts and see what they're doing and notice that they're total nonsense. And that's, I think, where we both came to the conclusion that that those patterns have to be broken up. And and once they're broken up or you start trying to break them up, the, the voices became they, be, they become very belligerent. They become very angry. They don't want that to happen. And they'll tell the patient not to show up for the for, uh, scheduled meetings. Uh, stop that. Uh, they'll get louder. They'll cause all kinds of uh uh, hallucinations and and it, it's it's almost like they're being burned you know they don't want interference with those patterns and the the whole the whole answer in a nutshell is if you're not feeling anxiety and you're not feeling fear of these voices because the voices are uh, something that's going on in your head and they don't belong to you. They they belong elsewhere. They came from elsewhere. If you don't have any fear of that and you don't have any anxiety of that or any other negative feelings, then the first reaction is, oh, my God, they're, she's she or he is cutting off my food source. I'm going to attack even more furiously to get them back to where they were before because I'm hungry. And if you continue with that, with you know the the no fear and you're looking at this and you're seeing for me anyway i finally saw the humor in their antics because they would even after something didn't work on me anymore it'd be like okay they got this program going on they can't help themselves it's like an ai that has to just repeat 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 the same thing over and over again when it already didn't work for me and I saw the humor in it, so I started laughing at them. And that drove them away instantly. And then the next thing that drove them away was when I would say, you know, I know this isn't me. I know this is you, so I send you love. And they would vanish. Yeah, I've seen that in other, other uh, people also, including if you mock them or laugh at them, they can't stand that. That's right. You know, so basically what I found, the ground rule is if you're doing something that they don't like that upsets them, 
in, in an attempt to try to help yourself, you're doing the right thing and they're screaming about it. They're trying to stop you. you know, so, so they'll try to make you forget to use that's a lie program or, or uh, uh, forget that they are parasites and that they're just trying to uh, drain your energy. Uh, or forget to read the Bible or forget to read a book or forget to show up at your uh, appointment. They can make you forget to do all kinds of stuff you should be doing to help yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the thing is that um, when you realize that these uh, voices are not yours and you're working toward getting rid of them, this is a lifestyle change. You can't continue living your previous lifestyle at all. You have to change your entire lifestyle. And that includes... The way you eat, the way you talk, the way you think, and what you read, what you watch on, on films. It's a total in the way you are with other people. So you have to change your whole entire lifestyle. And that's not the easiest thing in the world to do. But if you want to get rid of the voices permanently, you have to change your lifestyle. That's and all it there requires is. consistent effort. Yeah, it does. You know, even I, I sometimes, when I'm not thinking about anything, I'll get this, you know, I'll get this little voice pop in my head or something, and it's like, oh, <laughs> I forgot you were, you know, gee, I send you love, and then that's the end of it. So it's like an instant thing for me now, whereas when I was first going through this, it might take several days before I would even catch on that this was happening. You know, I'd go through hell for a few days, and it's like, oh, wait a minute. That's not me. <laughs> so I finally got to the point of over time and over practice and changing my entire lifestyle that, um, you know, and, and I would run across people from the past and they'd say, well, you used to do this. And I said, well, that was then and this is now. You know, if you don't like it, you can just go somewhere else. I don't really care anymore. That was then. This is now. And that's a thing that you can throw back at the voices, too, because when they'll come up with your past you can just automatically say, well, that was then, and this is now, I send you love. Yeah, and that's one of the things they use against you, and, and some of the most devastating, uh, I've heard this from two two patients, is um, they were tortured by these, and I think these were females, they were tortured by these voices um, uh, for years, and and they were badly sexually and physically abused. And then when their abuser died, I think in one case it was a husband, another one it was a father, um, they they were like, oh, thank God he's dead. Finally, finally, I'm done with having to deal with him. And then the voices started back. And since they have access to the person's memory, the entire memory, they can go in there and they can pull up everything that is in that memory. That for these two people, what they did is they went back and they pulled up these awful events that only the the victim and the deceased person knew about that were shameful and horrible. And they would bring those up and say, look, it, I'm not dead. I'm back to plague you again. Here I am. You remember when we did this or you did this or I did this. And, and the person would be horrified again. You know, so they will take on whatever form they need to to attack you and, and get you upset and angry and fearful and paranoid to generate that negative emotional energy on which they feed. And the, that's a lie program that they can't hook you. If you know that virtually everything they're telling you is a lie, you know, um, they can't hook you. They can't, they can't get their hooks in you because you don't believe what they're saying. And if you don't believe what they're saying, you don't take it as the truth. And if you don't take it as the truth, it loses its impact. Oh, yeah, it loses its power altogether. The people have to remember that these these entities have absolutely no power of their own. They can't generate their own power. They uh, they have to have negative energy to to survive. And and the more they get, the more powerful they become. So they're taking whatever energy we are giving them. And the, whether we know it or not, if we're giving them, if we're feeling negative about anything at all. There's a difference between being sad because, you know, some tragedy happened. You'd be sad. 
Uh, there's a difference between being afraid of uh, some instant thing that's going on, like somebody's chasing you. You'd be afraid so that you can run away or you can hide or you can, you know, vanish or disappear. And when that's over with, then it's over. But humans don't do that. Animals do that. Humans don't do that. They have to replay it over and over and over again. And that's when they're generating the, the negative energy. Exactly. Yeah. So if we can practice and it all takes practice, you can't do this in a day. It's like, you know, any anything that's worthwhile doing takes practice, whether it's playing the piano or the guitar or playing golf or playing or swimming or boating or hunting or whatever it is. If you want to be good at it, you have to practice it. Right. It's the same thing with this. If you want to be free of the voices, you have to practice and sometimes you're going to fail. So you just have to pick yourself up and do it again over and over and over again until you get good at it. So there is a cure for paranoid schizophrenia, but it does take work. Yeah, it um, does. And, and you have to be, it, it helps to be aware of the tactics that these voices use to get at people. And we've spoken about one now where, you know, you think that all thoughts that come through your head, you're taught that they belong to you. That is, that is not the case. That's the first lie. That's the first lie. Yeah. And, uh, you know, everybody has had, and we spoke about this previously, you've you've had some thought come into your head randomly that you should do something horrific, something really bad. And it's something you would never do. It's something you would never entertain on your own. But that thought barges into your head and it just do this, you know, hit this guy, punch this guy, curse this guy, uh, throw this. Uh, beat this guy up. Da, da, da. It, it's all these horrendous things that are going to get you in trouble. These things are fairly patient. They'll they'll sit back and they'll wait till the situation comes up that inflames you, and then they'll pour gasoline on it and set a fire, and they'll just get you raging against whoever or whatever. And usually that's tied into some kind of abuse you've had in your past, where this appears. Uh, the fear that you're experiencing is is false evidence based on your past programming, that that same thing is happening again. And these things are pouring gasoline on the fire to, to just promote that thought. Yeah, it's a complicated issue because everybody is different. Everybody has different experiences from birth to where they are right now. And everybody learns different things. And, uh, you know, there's no one size fits all. But we know that that's a lie program works for a lot of people it may not work for every single person because maybe that person is very entrenched in the lie and they can't fathom that it's not a lie so if they can't fathom that what they're hearing is not a lie well you know the program's not going to work and they they've got to want to get rid of the voices i mean you you have to have the desire to do that if you don't it nothing that we've come up with is going to work. That's true. And the, I mean, I, I read some of the comments on the hearing voices group and everybody has their opinions of what the voices are. And, uh, and so I just read through them and I'm thinking, you know, there, there are a lot of them that are continuously talking about how bad the voices are and, you know, what they've done and that's fine. That's fine. But at some point, they need to get off that track and start talking about what they're doing. Well, okay, this happened, and then I did this to to combat it, so that the rest of the people can see, you know, that this is this is this person really trying very very hard. And so this this kind of support, I think, is vital for. If oh oh yeah, it it breaks up the isolation. I noticed that we passed 700 members in that group this morning. Yeah. They're at 707 right now. Wow. So it's, you know, it's helping a lot of people. Uh, breaking the isolation. The, the voices don't want you talking about them to anybody. They, they just want you by themselves so there's no interference. Uh, mm -hmm. You can't let yourself get isolated. No, uh, to a point. I mean, it depends on the individual again. Because for me, I was isolated, and, and that's what I needed. So, 
it does depend on the individual, and I know that I'm not a normal, in, a regular. <laughs> no, you're a, you're a rare bird when it came to that. Okay, so it, 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 it's amazing you you were able to pull that off. I mean, uh, you you just don't quit. That's <laughs> you just wouldn't quit, and that's what it takes. Well, and I I think I had some spiritual help. In oh, fact, yeah. I know I had some spiritual help because my desire was so strong. You know, that I really didn't want to be living this type of life anymore. This, you know, I, I knew that there was, there had to be something else. I mean, uh, I'd already gone through all kinds of stuff and, and I uh, I had overcome the um, the major brainwashing, the, the purposeful brainwashing, and I didn't know about the the generic brainwashing that everybody in the world gets. I didn't know about that for a while. And so, but then after I got rid of the, the purposeful brainwashing, uh, you know, the thoughts were still there. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is not me. I thought the first, at, at, at first I thought that the, it was the brainwashing. And once I overcame that, then it didn't go away. And I, then I, I think it was then that I realized, okay, these are not, these voices are, these thoughts are not mine. You know, I mean, all along, even when I when I finally woke up to the fact that I had been brainwashed. And I don't remember how that came about other than. Yeah, I don't remember the moment that that happened, but uh, it happened and I remember driving down the road. And I don't remember what happened, but all of a sudden I said, oh, my God, I've been brainwashed. So whatever caused that realization to happen, I don't remember, but I set to work then to overcome that. Well, I, I remember you, you you making the, it was like the breakthrough was where you realized that you've been brainwashed and programmed and yes. that that program was similar to what you saw happening with the way computers were programmed. Yeah, that, yeah. That you you were running that program over and over again, and then you went to break it. Yeah, well, that happened after I realized I was brainwashed. That because I had tried, I once I realized that I was brainwashed, I set to work to figure out how to how to overcome that. And so I had this theory that if I had a a brainwashed thought and was a, was aware of it that was the first trick <laughs> becoming aware of this this was a brainwash thought then if i used a different uh synapsis in my brain because i had studied the brain quite a bit so if i used a different synapsis in the brain and used that constantly and didn't use the other one then the other one would atrophy and uh you know so then it was after that that i um got hooked up with the learning computer programming and seeing that correlation. So once I saw that correlation, I knew I was on the right track. So in effect, you were draining one program and putting your energy into another. Yeah. And I was so, you know, use it or lose it, right? So I had heard that phrase over and over and over again all my life, use it or lose it. And so I thought, okay, use it or lose it. If I don't use that that path and I use it and I develop another one, then that old path is going to atrophy and I won't be able to use it even if I wanted to. And that's true. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely true. Yeah, switching over to a different uh, thought stream. Now, now, one of the things that you did say that, uh, you know, I, I found true was that um, to simplify, because you have so many different kinds of thoughts of, uh, of different colors and intensities, but uh, one rule you came up with, you said that every negative thought about yourself or somebody else is the thought put there by the dark side. And that's pretty straightforward. Do, do you want to say a little bit about how you came to that conclusion? Mm. I found it to be true. It It is true. It is true because, um, I mean, I went through a period of time where I had a lot of negative thoughts about a lot of people and I always had negative thoughts about me. <laughs> so, so uh, yeah, I just, when I was going through this process of uh, working toward eliminating the voices, I realized that 
if I'm having a negative thought about myself and I know that I'm not that thing that I'm thinking, well, then that's not coming from me. It doesn't belong to me. So, so if I'm having a negative thought about somebody else, I don't know their whole story. How could I possibly know their whole story? So that thought is coming from somewhere else. We never know the whole story. We never know the whole story. Even, you know, halfway about ourselves, we don't even know the whole story. Yeah, let alone what's happened to somebody else. That's right. So if we can keep in mind that, okay, here's what I'm seeing with my tunnel vision about this person, but I don't know the whole story. Well, then you have some more leeway to expand your awareness of that situation. And it breaks the negative uh, train of thought that would follow. Like, oh, that guy's a a jerk or a fool or, you know, uh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to stay away from them or or whatever. You know, so when you started opposing your voices, you know, you, you come to the realization that these things weren't you. And you started taking action to oppose them and to start starving them out. Uh, what kind of reactions did you get from them when you started doing that? Oh, all hell broke loose. Yeah, that's what usually happens. Could you tell tell us about that? Oh, wow. What was, what was that like? Well, it was horrible. I mean, it was really, really horrible. It was like being attacked by a thousand people and you're the only one that, you know, is defending yourself. And uh, there were times when I really thought that I wasn't going to be able to uh, withstand it. And, um, I mean, it was a constant bombardment of just chatter, negative chatter. And I would even hear them talking to each other about me. (laughs) Yeah, that's common. Yeah, yeah. yeah, They they carry on conversations behind the bad guy's back. These were not audible voices. These were thoughts inside my head. Mm -hmm. And so... I want to make that clear because a lot of people hear audible voices. I didn't. Well, what happens is when they get stronger, they move outside. Yeah, I've heard that. And that's scary. That's yeah. really scary because now you know that for sure that this is something really strange going on. But while you're hearing them in your head, that's, you know, that's still kind of within bounds. Um, but that's common. when you When you go to oppose them, they go nuts. Well, the thing is, I remember one moment where, um, and I think I wrote about this in our book, um, where I was uh, I was being attacked so much that I, I, I kept having this thought that wasn't mine. Of, you know, it would be so much easier to just let go and fall over to the insane side and just let myself go insane and somebody would take care of me and I wouldn't be responsible for anything and life would be good. Well, if I remember correctly, they even told you that. The voices even told you, let go and... and yeah, that was the thought that was going through my head, and it was a very strong thought. And I I thought, but but I, Sherry, thought, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm just not going to do that. And it was, a, it was a, a real struggle. It was like maybe I was walking on a, you know, a tightrope, and... Um, there was a strong wind blowing me over to the the insane side and I was all by myself trying to bring myself back up vertical. So, uh, you know, I've just, uh, I just said, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. I don't care what happens. I am not going to do that. So that's that fighter in you that just would not give up. And that's that's what it takes because had you done that, you would have ended up locked up. Sure. Yep. So it's a battle. It's a real battle. And you have to have a very strong desire to uh, to live without these thoughts. And when you do, when you finally live without these thoughts, I mean, life just gets better and better and better. So, so was there... A pattern to as you continue to oppose these things. Uh, what I found is at some point when they when they start getting very weak, 
because you've you've drained them. You, you're no longer feeding them negative emotion and paranoia. Then they start begging and pleading and and trying to uh, work a deal with you. You know, like <laughs> if if you know, if you stop doing that, we'll let up on you and and we're your friends. And and did you run into any of that? No, but here's what I did run into. I remember my the night that I was um, I had just come back from martial arts class. And I had decided that I'd been working with getting rid of these thoughts for quite a long time. And so I did I did this uh, ritual in my apartment. OK, so this is the night that I'm going to take a leap of faith and I am going to change how I think and change who I am. Right. So. I turned the lights down and I got in a meditative state. And and I did this imaginary line on my floor. So I, I set up this this whole scenario in my mind and I was just going to take a physical big, huge, giant step across the room. Just just one big step. It was all symbolic. And so but I had this in my mind. And so as I was getting ready, I heard this thought and it was like, no, you can't do that. If you do that, we'll die. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, you know what? I don't care if you die. I don't care if I die. I'm doing this. And I did that. And uh, that was the end of the voices for a long time. Uh, and so I guess I, I guess they were gone for, oh, maybe a year. And then one day I was finding myself in this funk and I'm like, Okay, I was feeling pretty bad, and I can't remember what it was about, but something probably trivial. But it was turning into this big mountain out of a little molehill, and then I realized, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's these 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 entities trying to get in again. They're coming back to test the waters. And uh, but it took me a few days to realize. So then I'm like. Okay, well, I know that's a lie, and I know that's I know who you are, and thank you very much, but I, you're not welcome here. So that was before I learned how to say I, I send you love. So I just used the That's a Lie program, and that was the end of that. Well, I, I think what you did there uh, is, is critical as a, as a part of recovery, is that at some point you renounce these things, tell them straight up, I don't want anything to do with you. You're no longer welcome here. I, I don't want to listen to you. I want nothing to do with you. And whatever I did to bring these things in, uh, whatever agreement I made, I hereby renounce it. And and actually state that and tell them these things. Uh, because without it, they have like a tacit, uh, a tacit agreement to, to hang around. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, okay. Can you say something about the importance of renouncing these things and, and how you felt after you did that? Yeah, I mean, it's even in the Bible where you're breaking up. I can hear you. Okay, so uh, renouncing these things is very important. And so it's even in the Bible where um, if you say, get behind me, you can say, get thee behind me in, in the name of Jesus, if that's if that's what your belief is. But you want that negativeness to get behind you because you're in charge. You're the you're the um, you're the one that is filled with love and they are not. They're absent love. So if you just uh, that's on the religious side, that's on the Christian side. So if you're not Christian. You can denounce them anyway. You can uh, reject the contract. You can void the contract that you may have. And whether you think you have a contract with them or not is irrelevant. They think you have a contract with them, so that's what's important. So if they think they have a contract with you, you can reject it because it was, if it was signed at all or it was agreed to at all, it was under duress. Well, that's illegal. So it's it's a null and void contract. And they don't have your permission to to uh, barge in on your life. And when you tell them they don't have permission to barge in on your life and they do it anyway, they are purposely um, 
violating universal law and they will pay for it. So yeah, it's, it's important to renounce them and, and tell them they are not wanted any longer, that they serve no purpose, that uh, you want nothing to do with them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, one thing I've noticed is that uh, any positive spiritual belief or reading, they, they react to like it's acid. Um, the, the first time I noticed that was with the 23rd Psalm. Uh, I've, I had patients and more than one tell me that the voices reacted to the 23rd Psalm like uh, they were, somebody was pouring hot water or acid on them. Um, they, they can't stand positive spiritual stuff. They want you to uh, watch negative stuff, uh, horror movies, murder movies. Uh, and you, you look at this crap that they're playing over television all the time, these violent video games. This, that's the kind of stuff they're they're driving people toward. And it's exactly the, the, the stuff that you need to stay away from if you're hearing these voices, because it feeds them. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that you've sent me uh, about the, some of these um, horrible things that are the people have done i can't watch them you know i just can't watch them no, i can't watch some of them myself because yeah. i don't need that in my mind i don't need that in my mind at all i know that bad stuff happens but i don't need to see it um, yeah. be because i've already been through that and i i don't know what it'll do to me but i don't want to take any chances yeah, I don't read a lot of it myself. I, I, matter of fact, this uh, this mother that I've been working with, who uh, whose psychotic son murdered his girlfriend and cut her to pieces, yeah. uh, she she's got a collection of poems that she's gotten from him that he wrote that mm -hmm. shows the progression of the strength of these voices until they completely took over this guy. And I don't think I have the the I don't think I want to read them, yeah. even though I think at, at some level they are important because it'll show that progression and it'll expose the voices and, and how dark they are. I, I I don't think I can read those things. Well, if it's in the in the vein of uh, therapeutic help, um, perhaps you can find a way to read them without it affecting you. I don't know if there is such a way, you know, it's, um, because the mother has read them, right? Yeah. She's read them. Yeah. She's, she's just blown away by, you know, that's, that's what happens if you let these things keep going, mm -hmm. you know, they will eventually completely take you over like they almost had you. you know, and, and what they tell you to do is going to end, end you up in prison. And that's a perfect place for them. It's a consistently horribly negative environment where there's nothing but hate and turmoil and anxiety and paranoia and fear and games and tricks. It's hell on earth. Yeah. They feed in that environment. And as and soon as I walked into the doors uh, of, of the prison to go to work at, in the psych department, you could feel it. I mean, it was a palpable feel. It was just this, this negativity. And I felt like I was in some kind of bubble and, and yeah, that I re really didn't belong there. Yeah, before I started visiting Patrick, um, I, I would meditate before I would enter into the grounds and to protect myself because I, had, I knew that, there was, that this was going to be filled with negative energy. And uh, so if I hadn't done that, I, I probably would have been damaged. Well, I prayed for protection every time I went in there. And the times I didn't, I paid for it. Mm -hmm. Something went wrong. Mm -hmm. And it was very upsetting. Uh, but y you look at what, you know, the government, the deep state are doing. They, all the state hospitals have virtually been eliminated. All the, all the patients that used to be in state hospitals that were getting some kind of help at least, have now been thrown into prisons. You know, they, they receive minimal medication because they don't want to spend money on any psychotic medications unless the guy's causing problems. Then they'll spend money on the medications. Uh, I've run into that over and over again and watched some pretty violent things happen because they didn't want to give certain uh, prisoners any psychotic medications. People got seriously hurt. Um, so what they do is they, they, they throw them in there. They, they're psychotic. The gangsters will use them as torpedoes. 
you know, and the ones that are really violent, they'll make them stop taking their meds and then whip up this paranoia and say, well, well, this guy in this other gang is trying to kill you. You need to go take care of him first. And they'll they'll arm him and send him on his way to, to stab this guy. I mean, they were using these guys as, as torpedoes and then they get a lifetime sentence in there. And, you know, they that will be work out after seven years. And then they'd let those guys loose on the public with 50 bucks, just enough to go buy some cocaine or some alcohol, turn them loose on the streets on society after programming them for, for years to be heartless, cold, paranoid monsters. And then they turn them loose on society. There's virtually no rehabilitation going on in these places. Um, you know, they even restrict the AA and the NA groups, especially the NA, because they don't want to let drug, uh, ex-drug addicts into the prison. So they they don't let them get in there to, to help out. Uh, it, it's a very sick system, a, a very dangerous system. They're, they're not trying to help these people at all. And punishment doesn't work. 75 years ago, B.F. Skinner proved that it just temporarily suppresses behavior I- I- until the suppressing stimulus is no longer around and then it just goes up as if to make up for lost time and then goes back to the baseline where it was it does not work punishment does not work and yet the you know that's society's based on these prisons that's where they put these people with, with you know they all get out they all eventually get out you know why society is based on this right Society is based on this. Whatever happens in our prisons is an experiment to see how people react to X, Y, Z, whether it's uh, behavioral um, things or torture things or uh, medications or anything like that. They experiment on they they experiment on the prisoners. And so what they see works, they see how it works and then they put it out into the public. Well, so whatever you see in the prisons, you can know that this is what's coming next in society. Yep, you do what we say, or you, or you get punished. Yeah. So listen, I have to get going, and so uh, it was lovely talking to you, Jerry. And um, let's just close this. I'll, I'll record this. Remember, we, we are recording this, so we'll see how it works kind of long it's about an hour and a half so i don't know how this is going to work well do your magic with it you know <laughs> and, uh, and we'll, we'll put it up <laughs>